Iba't iba ang tao sa mundong ito Isa ang kulay ng dugo Iba't iba ang tao sa mundong ito Isa ang kulay ng dugo art and culture during pre-colonial. Now that we live in an era of technology and popular culture is dominating our lives, it became challenging for us Filipino to identify our true values. Filipinos are usually confused of art and culture that originated in our country art and culture that we already have during pre-Hispanic. The youth and the new generation usually favored a borrowed culture. As a result, they lack of knowledge and awareness to this matter. In the recent study of the National Economic and Development Authority, they stated that identifying the Filipino culture and common values is essential in creating well-targeted plans and effective policies that can bring about positive changes in the country. This is why, in this video, we will talk about 20 facts about Philippine art and culture during pre-colonial that would help us differentiate our unique identity among other countries. For number one, Baybay is a pre-Spanish Philippine writing system. The term Baybay literally means to spell in English. Baybayin was extensively documented by the Spanish and some have attributed it the name Alibata. But this name is incorrect. It was continued to be used during the Spanish colonialization of the Philippines up until the late 19th century. Baybayin is one of a dozen or so individual writing systems used in Southeast Asia, nearly all of which are abugidas where any consonant is pronounced with the inherent vowel a following it diacritical marks being used to express other vowels. Baybayin was noted by the Spanish priest Pedro Chirino in 1604 and Antonio de Morga in 1609 to be known by most and was generally used for personal writings, poetry, and etc. Number two, the Filipino people were dressed up only with shirtless called kanga and wraps known as bahag for their bottoms. However, once the Spaniards came to the country, modifications were made on the Filipino fashion sense. What is now known as the Barong Tagalog is the result of the evolution of the kanga. Laces, trimmings, and adornments and colors were added to the simple colorless shirt. Embroidery and buttons also became apparent on the kanga while the bahag was then replaced with trousers. This is also the same for the female costume counterpart of the Barong Tagalog, the Barot Saya. For number three, cooking in bamboo is a cooking method of Filipinos. Different groups of people within the islands had access to different crops and resources which resulted in different way of cooking practice. Cooking methods such as using bamboo to cook rice and meat has been practiced by our native Filipino. Native fruits, root crops, nuts and vegetables were eaten in the islands such as mango, pili nuts, and coconut, and ginger, etc. Using bamboo, they can also cook meat and seafood that was eaten all over the islands while certain Muslim groups did not consume the likes of pork and shellfish as part of their religion. For number four, Filipinos had already adobo even before the Spaniard came in the Philippines. Speaking of Philippine cuisine, we are known for our adobo dish. Some people question if adobo was originally invented by Filipino because it has similarity to Spanish and Mexican dishes. Borja Sanchez, a Spanish chef and culinary scientist, said that Filipino had adobo even before the Spaniard came to the Philippines and he has its proof. Sanchez read a lot of books from Spain's ancient archives to find out everything about the history of adobos, vinegars, and ancient Filipino cuisine. 
Sources for his research include records of ingredients brought to and from the Philippines abroad to Spanish galleons and Asian cookbooks such as Libro de Cocina by Roberto Nola and El Arte de la Cocina by Diego Granado. And for number five, we have our own shaman. Philippine shamans, commonly known as Babaylan, were shamans of the various ethnic groups of pre-colonial Philippines. These shamans specialized in communicating, appeasing, or harnessing the spirit of the dead and the spirits of nature. There were almost always women or feminized men called Bayok, so not only women can be a Babaylan. They were believed to have spirit guides by which they could contact and interact with the spirits and deities Anito or Diwata and the spirit world. Their primary role were as mediums during Paganito Siyan's rituals. There were always various subtypes of Babaylan specializing in the arts of healing, verbalism, deviation, and sorcery. Number six. Bahay Kubo or Nipahats were the native houses of our indigenous countrymen. Bahay Kubo or Nipahats were the native houses of our indigenous countrymen and were utilized since pre-Hispanic era. This house designs remains distinct and most identified with Filipino culture. Even up to that day, a lot of people still build their houses with the same type of design as Bahay Kubo, especially the provinces but most of the time, they use other material like cement to make it more stronger. Bahay Kubo was designed to endure the typical tropical climate of the country. The hot simple design that uses native materials like nipa and bamboo, which are widely available and affordable and makes it continuously used across the archipelago. It is also a common site in rural areas as well as in tropical resorts and villages. Bahay na bato or stone house is a type of building that rose in popularity during the Philippines' Spanish colonial period. Basically, it is an updated version of a bahay kubo. For number 7, during the pre-colonial Spanish, the ancient Filipino had expressed painting through tattoos. Tattooing was widely practiced in pre-colonial Philippines both for the purposes of ornamentation and rite of passage. This was particularly well known in the Visayas and among the highland tribes of northern Luzon. So, widespread was the practice of tattooing in the Visayas that the Spaniards coined the Visayans Pintados because their bodies were covered with tattoos. Batuk is the general term for tattoos in the Visayas. Even today, an annual feast called Pintados Festival is celebrated in Tacloban to pay tribute to the ancient tattooing tradition of the Visayans. In the mountainous part of northern Luzon, tattooing traditions are still preserved today within certain tribes. Number 8. Filipino lived in settlements called barangay before colonization of the Philippines by the Spaniards. Before the Spaniards came into the Philippines, there were existing culture of the Filipinos which were not distinguished by most of the Filipinos especially for the newborn Filipino citizen. The Filipino lived in settlements called barangay before the colonization of the Philippines by the Spaniards. As the unit of government, a barangay consisted of 30 to 100 families. It was headed by a datu and was independent by the other group. Usually, several barangays settled near each other to help one another in case of war or any emergency. The succession of datu was passed on by the holder of the position to the eldest son or if none, the eldest daughter. However, later, any member of barangay could be a chieftain based on his talent and ability. He had the usual responsibilities of leading and protecting the members of his barangay. In turn, they had to pay tribute to the tattoo, help him till the land, and help him fight for the barangay in case of war. For number nine, the dead was placed in a wooden coffin and buried under the house, complete with cloth, gold, and valuable things. During pre-colonial Spanish, the ancients distinguished mourning for a woman from that of a man, morotal for woman, and maglahi for men. Upon the death of the person, fires were made under the house and armed men act as sentinels to guard the corpse from sorcerers. Professional mourners were hired to accentuate the depth of mourning. Mourning for a dead chief is called laraw and this was accompanied by certain prohibitions like engaging in petty quarrels, wars, carrying daggers with hills in the normal position, 
singing in boat coming from sea or river, and wearing loud clothes. For number 10, the Manungul Jar as a Vessel of History. The Manungul Jar was one of the numerous jars found in a cave believed to be a burial site that was discovered on March 1964 by Victor de Calan, Hans Kasten, and other volunteer workers from the United States Peace Corps. The Manungul burial jar was unique in all respects. Dating back to the late Neolithic period around 700 BC, Robert Fox described the jar in his landmark work on the Tapun Caves. The burial jar with the cover featuring a ship of the dead is perhaps unrivaled in Southeast Asia. The work of an artist and a master of potter. This vessel provides a clear example of the cultural link between the archaeological past and the ethnographic present. The boatman is steering rather than padding the ship. The mass of the boat was not recovered. Both figures appear to be wearing a band tied over the crown of the head and under the jaw. A pattern still encountered in burial practices among indigenous peoples in southern Philippines. The manner in which the hands of the front figure are folded across the chest is also a widespread practice in the island when arranging the corpse. The carved brow and eye motif of the spirit boat is still found on the traditional watercraft of the Sulu Archipelago, Borneo, and Malaysia. Similarities in the execution of the ears, eyes, nose and mouth of the figures may be seen today in wooden carving of Taiwan, the Philippines, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. For number 11, shell was used as bracelets and pendants. In early days, shells were fashioned into tools as well as ornaments. The oldest known ornaments made from cone shells were found in the early 1960s in the grave of an adult male in the young cave in Palawan. A shell disc with a hole in the center was found next to his right ear and a disc with a hole by the edge was found on his chest. The shell ornaments were dated 4854 BC. Other personal ornaments such as earrings, anklets, bracelets, and beads recovered from the grave sites were found together with spoons, dippers, and other tools fashioned from shells. Shell beads recovered from other sites were made from cowrie, whelk, and conch shells. Shell beads were also recovered from Arco Cave in Cagayan, Ngipet Dulog Cave in Palawan, and in Bato Caves in Sursogon. A shell bracelet was also found in Bato Caves. For number 12, Kinilaw is at least 100 years old and one of the earliest food discoveries. In cultural historian Doreen Fernandez's essay, she quotes, food at the very beginning, end of quotes. She says that kinilaw, the seafood dish similar to a cabbage, has been in the country since 10th and 13th centuries AD. During the 1987 Balange excavation in Agusan del Norte, the researchers also found the tabon-tabon, which is a green fruit and bones of yellowfin tuna. Fernandez says, that both of these were cut in the same way as how the kinilaw is prepared today. Since kinilaw was made through soaring and not by fire, it was highly likely that they consumed this food as it was easy to make. It was the discovery of sea-going, river-faring people who knew the richness of the waters, the flavor of their wealth, and the high value of freshness. Fernandez wrote, For number 13, the earliest form of Philippine literature was the riddle. In author and professor Damiana Eugenia's essay, she quotes, Riddles to tease and teach. End of quotes. She asserted that riddles were among the first and most common use of words. Riddles have been found in every ethnolinguistic group across the Philippines. Bugtong in Tagalog and Pampango. Patotodon in Bicol. Burbucha in Iloco. Pabitla in Pangasinan, Kabuni in Ibatan, Tigmo in Cebuano, Paktakon in Hilagaynon, Titiguhon in Waray, Antoka in Maranao, and Tigum Tigum in Tausug. Nonsense words were also coined just so it can go well with a particular rim. A riddle was found with the title Kukurukutong, but this was only a fictitious name for a person that was used to rhyme with the sentence Pumubulay walang gatong. For number 14, the earliest coin was made of gold. 
it's not surprised that most pre-colonial Filipinos had no knowledge of money, but instead were trading through gold. In author Angelita Legarda's essay, she quotes small change. She noted that early Spanish chroniclers noted that Filipinos then were already experts at evaluating the quality of gold. Coin specialists have also found the earliest Filipino coin, which was a small gold piece no larger than a pea, shaped like a rounded cone, with a character stamped in relief at the base, and it called Piloncito. They called it such because the gold bits look at the same as the sugar receptacle called Pilon. Further proof that the gold bits were indeed the coins used by early Filipino surface when the largest Piloncito was found to weigh 2.65 grams, which is equivalent to one mass, the standard weight of gold that was used across the Southwest Asia. For number 15, women in the pre-colonial Philippines enjoyed nearly equal status with men. Women in pre-colonial Philippine society had the right to inherit property, engage in trade and industry, and succeed to the chieftainship of the barangay in the absence of a male heir. Had the exclusive right to name their children. Men walk behind them as a sign of respect. Prior to colonization, both men and women could get a divorce for the following reasons failure to meet family obligations, childlessness, and infidelity. Children, regardless of gender and properties, were equally divided in a divorce. Since a man needed to pay a dowry to the woman's family, she was required to give it back should she be found at fault. If the man was at fault, he then lost the right to get back his dowry. For number 16, women who do not have tattoos were typically viewed as imperfect and shamed in Kalinga tribe. The process of tattooing is known among the Kalinga people as batok, and the resulting designs are symbolic of strength and power. To the extent that Dinaras, women who do not have tattoos were typically viewed as imperfect and shame. For the men of the tribe, tattoos represent courage and the status of being a Kalinga warrior. While for women, they symbolize maturity, fertility, and beauty. Kalinga body art and tattoos have a long, rich history that inextricably ties into the life and culture of the indigenous community. Unlike modern day tattoos, they only have a personal connection with the wearer. The Kalinga tattoos have important social and cultural connotations. Their social symbolism is what sets them apart from modern tattoo art as we see in our cities. While tattooed Kalinga men were considered to be men of valor and bravery, Tattoos on Kalinga women's bodies would signify them coming of age, ready to take on marriage and motherhood. For number 17, during the prehistoric times, theater in the Philippines was in the form of indigenous rituals, verbal duets or games, or songs and dances to praise God. According to early chronicles, prehistoric dramas consisted of three elements, meat, nemesis, and spectacle. These mimetic performances mostly dramatize primitive rituals and epic poetry about deities and mythical legends where the spirit of the deities would seemingly possess a Catalunan priest or Babaylan priestless. During this entrance state, the priest or the priestless would consume the sacrificial offering which would be in the form of big chicken, rice, wine, or nuts. When the Spaniard reached our shores, they used dramas such as Zorzuelas as a pedagogical tool to influence the pagan tribes and teach them about Christianity and religion. Another important form of theater popularized during the Spanish colonialization is the media, also known as Moro Moro, Liambay, or Aracio. It is a play in a verse that portrays the lives, loves, and wars of Morons and Christians. For number 18, early Filipinos believed in animism. 
The Asian Filipinos believe, like many animistic people, that all objects had spirits or were inhabited by such even seemingly inanimate objects like rocks, mountains, lakes, etc. And natural phenomena like wind, thunder, and fire were said to be inhabited by particular spirits or to be governed by certain gods. In ancient times, Filipinos made offerings to particular trees that were thought to be the habitation of benevolent deities or even certain ancestral spirits. Other trees were thought to be house malevolent spirits and care was taken to avoid sleeping under these trees. Not surprisingly, the Filipino belief in animism also supported the widespread concept of totemism in which humans had certain kindred animal spirits. For number 19, early Filipinos had a belief in afterlife. Generally, it was believed that good went to heaven while the evil went to hell. The every widespread belief that heaven and hell were divided into different levels was also found in the Philippines. Which region one goes to depends on different factors. For example, those who die accidentally go particular to heaven or hell. Usually whether one goes to heaven or hell, the individual is able to work up to higher levels and is not condemned for eternity to stay in one place. Merit or self-improvement is the usual way of rising to the next level, although in some cases, something like purgatory exists. And last but not least, for number 20, the pre-colonial Filipinos were predominantly barefoot. For Filipinos born in the 70s through the 90s, slippers or chinelas represent more than just a type of footwear. They are both a tool for corporal punishment and an implement for playing tumbang preso. In the 1500s, Filipino nobility adorned themselves with fine clothing, silk, doublets with gold trimming, gold bonds, and thick gold chains around their necks, but evidently lacking in everything to protect their feet. Slippers were a foreign concept of Filipino in the pre-colonial era. However, trading and intermarrying with foreigners allowed foreign and indigenous cultures to merge. The slippers or chinelas we recognize today were introduced to the Filipinos by the Japanese over 400 years ago. If you are truly a Filipino, learn, embrace, and be proud of our own art and culture. Help us in promoting art and culture not only in your region but in the whole country because it's more fun in the Philippines. Thank you for watching guys. Hope you enjoyed this video and you learned a lot from our presentation. Don't forget to hit like and leave us a comment of what you think about this video. Again, this is Joshua Baluyo. And I'm Anjali Texaan. And I'm Jamie Debeas. Keep safe everyone. Bye-bye.